My name is Sean Lee, and I'll be talking to you about what Pivotal is doing with financial services institu uh, inst institutions around the world, and more specifically, what we're doing in the area of fintech. Now, you've seen this slide previously from, from Rob's presentation already, and this one is particularly relevant for uh, the conversation that I'm having with you today, because this is one of the largest investment bank in the world, and this is a CEO of that company saying that Silicon Valley is coming and they're, they're, dis they're actively disrupting them in the industry. Now, they're not the only large enterprises that are saying that. In fact, if you look at other companies, companies like Bank of America, Wells Fargo, they're all feeling the same pressure as well. Now, the interesting aspect here is that these large companies traditionally would see each other as competition. And they still do, in the same effect as kind of same two very large sumo wrestlers you know, fighting each other. But that's more or less what's, happening, what's been happening in the past. But right now, what we're seeing now, the trend is more like this. So large companies are facing a lot of competition from smaller companies. And in the case of financial services, these are fintechs that are really popping up everywhere around the world in the United States, in Asia, in China and Japan. And you could see that uh, right, right around the, the market as well. Now, if we break it down a little bit more, if you take a look at the Wells Fargo and this one over here is HSBC, if you look at every product and services that these financial institutions are offering, almost every single one of them have some sort of startup that is attacking them in that space, right? Some startup is thinking about some innovative idea, easier way to connect with the user, and they're going after that market right against these big financial institutions. So the reality is, whether the financial institutions like it or not, they need to innovate. They need to innovate very quickly. They also need to figure out a way of either com competing against these fintechs or just becoming a disruptor themselves, just as what Rob talked about this, uh, this morning. Now, fintech is not a US phenomenon. You probably see a lot of statistics and newspaper clips around fintech communities in New York, in London, in San Francisco, and so on. But fintech is actively and aggressively happening in Asia as well. In fact, if you look at the left-hand side of your screen, you could see that fintech investment have quadrupled just in the past year, right? It's gone up four times. The investment going into fintechs in Asia have gone up four times. If you look at the right-hand side, some of the new statistics and some of the new players that are going into these industries are actually fairly well-known names. In fact, in China, Alibaba, which most of you would probably know as an e-commerce marketplace, they are now a very large financial services player in the Chinese market. If you look at the areas that they are targeting, it is predominantly around mobile payments, it is around lending, it is around micro, micro loans, and areas that traditional banks may not typically focus after, but now these companies with their breadth of user base, with their understanding of user behavior, are now aggressively going into the financial services market as well. In fact, if I were to elaborate a little bit more, on these two very large internet players. One is Alibaba, the other one is Tencent. You will know Alibaba as an e-commerce marketplace. You will know Tencent as a messaging platform, similar to Line that you use here in Japan. Now, these are not traditional financial services companies. These are internet companies. But if you look at what they're doing now in terms of financial services, Alibaba is offering micro deposits. They are in the payment space. They are actually one of the largest payment processors now in China. You're also looking at do them doing micro loans to small, medium-sized businesses. Tencent, the same way. They're also offering various different credit products through their partnership uh, as well. Earlier this year, in 2015, just this year, both of them have acquired banking licenses to operate as a bank in China. Alibaba calls theirs my bank, and Tencent calls theirs WeBank from their messaging platform WeChat. 
And this is the reality now. This is happening right in Asia. It might not be small startups that are attacking the industry. The large internet players are attacking the industry as well. So this is happening around the region. And if we look at the various different segments that these fintech companies, these internet companies are going after, they're typically broken into these major segments. On the top, you have things like lending, you have things like personal finances, mobile payments, peer-to-peer -peer payments. In the middle, you've got a lot of investment-centric products. In fact, one of the hottest areas here now is this notion of a robo-investor, right? So using algorithmic uh, uh, techniques to identify and manage portfolios for the, for the customers. And then in the bottom, you've got more traditional services, research, uh, banking infrastructure, and so on and so forth. So these are the major categories that you see around fintech. Now, there's also one interesting aspect in this slide that you could see as well. There are many more logos on the top than in the bottom. And that, that is an integration in terms of the areas that these companies are creating and innovating around new services and products. There are very few companies now that are still focusing around the infrastructure aspect of banking. They are all focusing around the product and services aspect of banking, whether it is towards the consumer market, the, 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 the um, commercial market, or in some cases towards their own partner ecosystem as well. And later, later in my presentation, I'll share with you what we're doing with some of these customers so you could see if these are some, uh, some very relevant use cases that you may be going through in your company as well. So we tip, when we look at this industry and when we look at FinTech in general, there are usually three approaches that we take. Uh, these three approaches are geared towards the type of customers that we are working with. On the very top, there are FinTech startups. Right, Rob talked about some of those uh, in his slide earlier. These are independent startups and their primary primary objective is time to market, right? Startups, they need to get to market very quickly. So we help them with our Pivotal Labs capability, as well as some of our mobile services as a product as well. So that's the independent startups. But then we also work with banks that are either helping or funding startups, right? Creating their own innovation lab, creating their own hackathon kind of community where they're encouraging fintechs to create new ideas so that they can bring it back into the bank. So there are bank, that bank funded startups that we're working with as well. Now, their objective is going to be a little bit different. Time to market is still very important, but portability, compatibility because, be, becomes more of the important aspect of what they're trying to target. They want to make sure the investment that they put into these fintechs the new ideas, the innovative projects, have an opportunity to make it back into the bank, connect into their existing systems fairly seamlessly. So that's a very different objective for this group of customers. And then the last one over here, these are financial institutions that are saying, look, I have my traditional business, I am doing fairly well, but because I am an industry leader in my particular segment, I want to see if I can leverage my technology services and create a new business model to help with my suppliers, my marketplace, other companies that I may be working with as well. So they're looking at this not purely from a new product and services perspective. They're looking at it as a new business model, right? New business model so that they can reach new markets and enable more partners to be leveraging their services and thereby transacting through their systems, which is a win-win for all parties. So these are three major aspects, uh, ma three major financial services or fintech uh, type of customers that we typically work with. They're slightly different approaches because their objectives typically are fairly different. So let's go into some examples around these. So we'll talk about the independent startups first. So you look at uh, the type of capabilities that they typically work with Pivotal with. They're looking at our agile methodology, our agile software development capabilities to help them build that product. And they're also looking at leveraging a lot of our mobile capabilities because most of these startups, 
they don't start on the web, they start on the mobile devices now. They're going to market first with a mobile first mentality. Right? So these are the two areas that they typically work with us on. An example, um, to, and, and to go into a little bit more detail around why they're working with us, you know, a lot of these startups, you know, they're fairly familiar with Agile, but it is not just about Agile that we offer to them. We help them properly design the products with continuous user feedback. We help them figure out, once they launch the product, how do they manage it on an ongoing basis? We help them figure out, are there new innovative ideas, features that they, they can continue to add into the product so that it is not a static one-off product. It is growing as their user base are growing and as their user requirements are changing. So when we talked about our Pivotal Labs capability and how we work with them, it is all of these aspects that we're helping them tra train them, build the products with them, enable them to, to be able to do the same thing as what a lot of the larger internet uh, companies that we've worked with in the past are working with us on as well. So let's take a look at some examples. So the first one here on your left-hand side, this is Capital One. This project was actually done in New York. And this is an, a, an application where they wanted to enable peer-to-peer -peer payments. Right? So a project done in New York. This one over here, this one was done in Toronto. It's a company that is spe specifically focusing around a mobile wallet capability. And they're one of the first into the market. Essentially, what they're doing here is allowing their customers or users the opportunity to use the mobile phone and, and leverage the camera and actually capture the credit card information. So you no longer have to carry multiple cards with you. You can carry your phone, and it acts as the mobile wallet towards the POS systems that are able to read the information directly from there. So one happening in New York, one happening in Toronto. Let's take a look at a couple more examples. One on the left-hand side. This one was done in London, uh, London, England. And this is predominantly around identifying small, medium-sized loans that they're able to offer towards their customers, right? Making it very, very easy and seamless in terms of the approval process. So whoever needs the loan, they can do the credit check very quickly and be able to assign the funds directly to them right off the bat. One more over here. This one was done in LA, right? So this one is actually very, uh, very interesting because it is now a platform that allows various different startups to raise funds, right, through something similar to a, like a Kickstarter kind of community, but in terms of raising funds for other startups that are going into the market. Various, four very different examples. You could see all four of them are focusing on different areas, different segments that I talked to you about previously, and all of them have one primary goal of reaching the customers fast, launching the product very quickly, and they can continue to iterate and continue to learn along the way so that they can make the services much broader and much more dynamic. So that's what we work with in terms of the independent startups. What about banks that are actually funding the startups? So let's take a look at that. Now, when we talked about it, we said that the primary objective is not only time to market, it's also around portability, compatibility. If they invest in these startups, big banks, if they invest in these startups, they want to make sure the investments that they put into these companies can become part of the bank, in a sense, right? New products and services that they can offer. So what becomes very imp important here is this notion that they need a platform for the startups to deploy their new applications, and they need a platform internally to connect with the existing systems as well. So that, the compatibility, using a platform, the cloud platform that Rob talked about this morning, becomes a very key consideration factor when they're looking at these type of initiatives. So before we talk about the examples, though, we have to talk about one very key aspect in terms of architectural design for these startups. Most of these startups, when they look at building new functionalities, they are not looking at building things in the old traditional monolithic way. By monolithic, what that means is it is one application that have lots and lots of dependency against each other. When something breaks, you need to fix the whole thing. 
That's a traditional approach of building applications. But the newer applications operate like this in the notion of what the industry is calling microservices. These are modular services that are highly reusable, highly repeatable, and you can manage and scale them independently. Now, if you think about the functionalities that these startups are building, they are not looking at a small customer segment. They are trying to target customer segment that may very well be worldwide. And when that is the case, when you, when you put in time zone considerations, and when you put in the user behavior around different, uh, different uh, areas around the world, this type of architectural design becomes very, very important because it is highly scalable and is highly distributable. In fact, we're not the only one championing this notion. If you look at this article that was done in October this year, so two months ago, in the Wall Street Journal, they talk about how companies, if, for, for them, if they don't leverage the notion of microservices, well, they're going to be an issue, right? Especially around new functionalities that they're building towards their customer uh, engagement models. So the rise of microservices becomes very important. And to do microservices properly, you need to have a platform that allows you to handle it, whether these are applications that are deployed off-premise or whether these are applications that are deployed on-premise within your own data center. Now, when we look at financial services in general, let's go back into some of the capabilities that companies are looking for. In fact, when they're looking at building these microservices architecture, they're predominantly looking at the same functionality that they've always had in the bank, but really breaking them up and making them highly reusable. Very often when we talk to banks, traditional banks, we find that they have functionalities that are basically exactly the same that have been deployed and written 10, 20 different times by different line of businesses. They all think they have something very unique that they need to put in, but at the end, the functionality pretty much all look the same. So the idea here is to be able to consolidate the, the type of applications and functionalities into reusable services, very similar to what you see in the green boxes in the middle, and be able to identify a platform that allow different line of businesses and the technology teams to be able to reuse them just as if they are playing with Lego. It's just different building blocks that they need to put together to create the new application that they want to release in the market. So this is a financial services ecosystem that we're actively building with our customer. And if you look at uh, the next slide here, this is one of our partner, a company called First Data. Again, this is a very recent news. This was uh, published in September of this year, where we are working with this very large car processing company and be able to leverage some of their functionality, and in this case, specifically their e-commerce uh, APIs and, 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 and services, and make that available to the Spring community that can be deployed on Pivotal Cloud Foundry. This is our way of working with the larger ecosystem of partners, especially in the financial services industry, and be able to add some contextual, in the industry context, around this platform capability that we're offering out into the market. And this is important because when you're working with banks that are working within their own traditional environment, but also working with new startups that they're funding as well, having something repeatable that follow the same methodology, same architectural design, make it that much easier to be able to bring the new and the old and the legacy all together. Let me talk to you about one example that's happening in China. Now, every time I visit this customer, um, I get a very, uh, very, deep, you know, very deep feeling in regards to why they're actively working with Pivotal. The reason is this is China's China Merchant Bank. This is one of the largest banks in China and the 43rd largest in the world by market capitalization. This bank, the office that we typically do the projects in, is literally opposite the street from Tencent. So you can, I, you can almost feel that they see Tencent right across the street, and Tencent is actively going into financial services, offering almost the exact same type of services that this traditional bank is offering as well. So you can see the competition, not only in the digital space, but physically, they're opposite to the street as well. So they're under a lot of pressure to innovate, to create new things, to create new models 
where they can still remain highly relevant in China's financial services market. So we have been working with them very actively in looking at and deploying their existing applications on Pivotal Cloud Foundry, but their goals are also very aggressive as well. In fact, what they want to do now is, the, is to be able to build an open banking platform, making them the equivalent of an Alibaba for the financial market, the banking market in China. So what are they building? Let me use a diagram to illustrate what they're trying to do. So this is a very high level diagram in terms of what they're trying to build uh, with us with, uh, on Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Um, the bottom here, the bank's legacy IT system, that's their core banking system. So that doesn't change, right? That's your existing environment that they're using today. But what they're doing now is identifying services that can be made openly, you know, published openly as an API. And they will make that available in, in the same notion as an app store. Now the goal here is this. Once they've been able to do that, then they can identify where it says number one, innovative startups, companies, different groups. They can in invite different companies, different startups to be able to create these innovative ideas, innovative apps, innovative services that leverages the same API that connect and transact through their own banking system. Now, this is very, very important to them because they want to create an ecosystem that is based on their own banking platform their own banking network. And the goal here is they'll be able to identify and launch to the market lots and lots of these innovative apps, but every single one of them will be transacting through their network. So this is now a win-win situation for the bank. They can now create an ecosystem, just like what Alibaba have done on the e-commerce side, but they can do that for the financial services companies as well. So that's an example. Now, the last example here are banks or financial institutions that are turning themselves into a service provider, okay? So what basically what they're doing here is looking at their existing assets. And by assets, I mean technology services, platforms, data, analytics, and their capabilities around their customer service and be able to wrap that as new services that they can offer towards their partner, partner community. Now, uh, the same way as before, the cloud, the cloud platform becomes very important because you always need a common platform to build on. The notion of open source becomes very important, but also the notion of using data analytics to create new insights and offer that towards their partner community becomes important. Giving them raw data only does so much. People are increasingly looking for value-added services and gaining additional insights insights that users typically are not able to generate themselves becomes a key value asset that they're able to offer to their community. And typically when we're looking at the data analytics capability that they're looking for, it usually kind of go into this manner. So some company says, okay, for us to turn ourselves into a service provider, we have to get our foundation ready. And by foundation, they mean the cloud platform for deployment of applications, but they also mean they needed to modernize their existing data infrastructure that allows them to have the capability to draw and collect data from wherever they are, internally within the bank and externally within the bank as well. They need a modern data architecture that allows them to be able to do this. That's the foundation. Once they have the foundation done, then they need to be able to have the capability to leverage things like data science to identify and create these new insights and the insights will then go into the application that they'll, work, that they'll build and be able to release out into the market. We see this as an iterative cycle, right? It is not just doing big data or doing data science. It is an iterative cycle that allows them to take their existing assets, existing data, be able to create something innovative, unique, that their partner community will be able to subscribe into and thereby using their services to transact through various different offerings that they're creating in the market. So we'll look at one example here, a company called CoreLogic, one of the premier real estate data service provider, right? So what they've done with us, and they've been a customer with us for quite some time for Pivotal Labs capability and also on the Pivotal Cloud Foundry platform as well, 
And one of the first steps that they've done, right, modernizing their, in, their existing application and data infrastructure and be able to consolidate the capabilities that they have, right, going from 700 to, three, 700 to 300 and continue to do more. Now, the goal of that is not purely consolidation. The goal of that is as this company, CoreLogic, expands into various different markets around the world, and we're working with them not only in the United States, but also in Australia, in China, and in other parts of the world where their customers are predominantly the local and regional banks. So the ability to have these applications and services and data models that they're able to share in different markets very rapidly and be able for these banks, these partners, these customers of theirs to consume that in a very rapid manner becomes a key business driver for them to build this capability around our platform. So that's one example around core logic. Let me bring to you another example in China. Um, there, like, like I told you before, there are lots happening in Asia already. So that's why I wanted to bring you more Asian examples than just uh, US examples that you've probably seen previously. This one is China Citic Securities. They are the largest investment bank in China. Okay, the largest investment bank in China. And they, they already have market dominance. Their market share is fairly high. But what they've determined was that in or, in, instead of them reaching their customers directly, they also have these other markets where they can work with suppliers, hedge fund managers, asset managers that don't belong in the bank, but be able to offer services for them and be able to allow their network and their relationship to reach new customers as well. As a bank, even though they have the largest share in China, they're not covering the entire country. They need their partners to be able to do so. So what they've done is instead of hiring more people, they've taken their applications and capabilities, launched it onto a cloud platform, and be able to allow their partners to use those services as if it's their own, so that they can then reach out through their own customers and be able to transact accordingly on that network. So this is China's Citic security. So what does that actually really look like? So let me show you what that looks like. So these are four different applications that they have launched on our platform. Let's go from the first one, Hedge Fund Hotel, right? Quite obviously, for this application, the target audience is not the actual investor. The target audience is actually the hedge fund managers that are either work for Citic Securities or they're affiliated with Citic Securities. The objective here is a lot of these hedge fund managers, they don't really have a lot of technology capability. They don't have new ways of launching mobile applications quickly. They have no new ways of or efficient ways of communicating with the customer. But what they're able to do now is leverage this new application and services around this notion of a hedge fund hotel that Citic Securities have offered for them, they can now use this almost as their own store, as their own office, as their, as their own agency, for them to reach their customer and be able to offer various different funds that they have available within their portfolio. Now, the, the reason why they call it a hotel is because if you look at the notion of a hedge fund, they only want so many investors to be in that fund. Once they fill it up, they might want to pull it off the market and be able to continue to grow it on the side. So this notion here as a hotel is that they can onboard their hedge fund onto the hotel, and when they've achieved their goals, they can pull back, almost like checking into a hotel, and then for a period of time, and then checking out of the hotel afterwards. The same thing for private equity funds, right, that are happening in China as well. Look, obviously different markets, different constituents, but they're offering very similar capabilities. So other investors can go into this application. By the way, these are all mobile applications, either on the mobile phone or on the tablet. So they're able to look at them and say, okay, well, which are the funds am I interested in? What do I want to subscribe into? Who's the private, private um, equity fund manager that I need to contact? Can they communicate with me directly? And what are some of the news around these funds? Okay, same thing with asset managers portfolio managers, and some financial advisors as well. The goal here is this. All of these are offered by Citic Securities on their financial services cloud, built on Pivotal Cloud Foundry. But 
what they're trying to do here is basically create a new set of services that they already have, but they're creating it to allow their larger constituents to be able to leverage these service, connect into their user base that typically are not customers of Citic. So by leveraging technology and data assets, they have now been able to reach into new markets, reach new customer segments that they don't have to go directly into anymore, thereby creating a brand new business model by leveraging technology and capabilities. So very different model. This is obviously not a fintech. It is not a small company. They're also not funding small companies. What they're doing here is taking their existing assets, turning themselves into a service provider, reaching new markets, reaching new customers, and on the way, be able to create a brand new business out of all of the things that they're doing over here. So what I share with you today are some examples around financial services institutions that we're working with around the world. Some of them are very small. Some of them are very large. Some of them are in the United States, some of them in Europe, some of them right here in Asia. The objective of this presentation is to be able to share with you, when you think about your model, when you think about your institution, whether you're in financial services or not, you want to be able to look at the technology, not purely from a technology perspective, but look at the business context around it. Match it around some of the initiative that you and your executive may be looking at and be able to think, if I innovate faster, if I launch products faster, if I go to the mobile technology first, am I going to gain any advantage? And who's my primary competitors today? Is it the same competition that I've been seeing for a very long time? Or is it these new startups that are popping up from all over the place domestically and internationally? And how do I compete against them? So hopefully these examples give you some idea around what we're doing around the industry and if there are any additional details that you want to find out about these use cases or other use cases that you may be interested in, please reach out to our Pivotal team and we'll be very happy to share with you in more detail. Thank you very much for your time.